Thank you so much. And we are just privileged to be here, Maggie. We so appreciate it. We love this TV and we're so enjoying the MOOC. And um, we're just delighted to get to be a little part of this. So thank you so much. So as um, as Maggie said, uh, I am Becky Adams, L.A. Pinion, here at NSL. And um, I am the Director of Faculty Services and um, Online Course Development at the University of New Mexico. And I'm also an instructor for Organization Information and Learning Sciences. And so today, I have one of my fantastic students, um, Shannon Roberson Wildenstein. And um, she is Donati Fire here in, in our virtual world. And we are just delighted to be with you. So Shannon, let me let you introduce yourself just a bit. Okay, so I, yeah, my name is super hard to pronounce. <laughs> um, I'm Shannon Robertson Wildenstein, um, and I am a master's student in the organization Information and Learning Sciences. Um, I'll actually graduate in three weeks, and I have um, taken all of my classes online, and actually the second semester that I was in the program, I took um, Becky or Ellie's class on virtual worlds and fell in lo love with the environment and um, have been in here since. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been delighted to have her as well. Um, so just to give you a tiny bit of background, uh, uh, certainly our uh, talk today is about connecting and creating a community of practice utilizing virtual worlds in a higher ed um, environment. Um, and our university has about 30,000 30, students, and 13,000 of them um, take online courses each year. Our, the program that I teach for that Shannon uh, and I are going to be talking about is entirely online. And so students who want degrees from uh, our program must take their courses online. It isn't. Uh, an option for them that often um, leaves us with a few challenges. Um, I started teaching for the college of education and I had been introduced to opportunities that the virtual worlds offer while I was doing my doctoral studies and I was actually um, not quite convinced that they were conducive to teaching and learning but I was fascinated by the connections that were made and the longer I dabbled and hung out in Second Life, the more of these connections I saw. So as I um, listened to the experts, I had a really wonderful experience hearing from a middle school teacher about how her students were, giving, were given an opportunity to explore exploring who they were and who they wanted to be by manipulating their avatar and making it be the best looking man or woman over the course of three class sessions, I kept um, an open mind because I trusted what she was saying and was quite, quite fascinated about it. Um, these students had conversations that they would have never had without that experience uh, because, and they didn't end up being the Barbie and Ken avatars as it turns out, but they ended up with deep conversations between themselves about who they wanted to be and what was important to them. Um, this is certainly a conversation we want all our kids to have during that very stressful time of middle school. And so I kept watching our experts. Um, I took my pre-service teachers into Second Life to experience it. Um, because I wanted them to see all learning environments and, and again was fascinated by this middle school teacher. And then when I moved over to our program and I began teaching the theory and practice of online learning, I felt it was important to have my students at least see um, what a virtual world offered um, and how it can, how that we could benefit from having student connections that were so important to our online students. Um, we feel very deeply that communities of inquiry off, offer opportunity for deeper learning and virtual worlds did seem to offer an opportunity for our students who were not getting to meet face to face um, to work together. So beginning in 2013, 
um, we began to offer a summer eight-week course exploring virtual worlds. And this is the course that Shannon just spoke about. It was a student-centered, hands-on course where students were given more time to explore virtual worlds in teaching and learning. Um, in this course, they meet experts, they learn to build, and they build a final project that will require them to create a learning environment here in Second Life. Uh, the following fall, I had two students, one of them was Shannon, who had already taken this the Exploring Virtual Worlds course, and they took my Theory and Practice course in the in, for e-learning. And this course had a required bi-weekly synchronous session uh, that our program really valued. So the first session was led by me, and I was modeling uh, using online synchronous approaches. Um, and we used both web conferencing and Second Life, uh, modeled by me, in order to set up support to um, to set up sessions that were to support student learning concept learning uh, concepts that had to do with e-learning theory and practice. The synchronous sessions occurred at the end of a two-week module, and after my first two, I asked the students, did they want which one did they want to use? Because they actually were uh, required to lead a session. So each time that a group of students led a session, I gave them the choice to use virtual worlds or web conferencing. Um, one group led, one of the group led sessions, uh, the first group led session, they chose to use Second Life. And I was delighted and, and not surprised because I thought they might be curious about it, but we did have several people that were um, wondering uh, how this would all work. And so I expected that the next group would move back to web conferencing. Interestingly, every group for the past two years have chosen Second Life um, to work in. So we thought that we would like to talk about that. Part of the, the theories that we're going from are uh, certainly uh, more theory about transactional distance. And you guys are probably very familiar with that. But he talks about the distance between the, the, the transaction being the learning experience and the distance that online um, causes. Um, so, Sharon, I think you might like to talk a little bit about this. So let's let's explore transactional distance for just a moment. Sure. So um, Moore's whole theory is based more on not so much the geographic or geographical distance that separates the instructor and the learner, but more like Becky said, the actual um, distance and transactions. So. You know, you can have a learning setting where you're sitting face to face in a classroom and an instructor is giving you a lecture and you never really get the chance to um, ask the instructor questions or interact with the instructor. And so sometimes the information that's being presented, there's still ambiguity to it um, in the learner's mind. Um, and in this way, this can also happen online as well. Um, I'm not saying it's just face to face, but it can also happen online as well. Um, or you can have, if if that were the case, where you had a you know learning situation where you had very little interaction with the instructor, that would really be um, you have a lot of structure in the environment, so it has to be set out a certain way. Um, so transactional distance really revolves around the structure of the class and the amount of dialogue that's between the learner and the instructor. So if you have, on the other hand, a situation where you are able to interact with your instructor a lot, you get great feedback from them, then you have what's called low transactional distance. Um, Whereas if you have very little feedback and interaction between you and the instructor and a lot of structure, then that's what they call high transactional distance setting. Um, so 
for me as an online learner, um, I will just preface this with the fact that the first and only time I had synchronous sessions um, online was in Second Life. So my first exposure to any type of synchronous learning online, and I had had two classes before. I had taken um, the Virtual Worlds class uh, in, in the summer. They were all asynchronous. We never met um, synchronously. We did a lot of the work independently. Um, and our instructor did give good feedback there. So, I mean, we still had feedback, but we never had a synchronous session. But I'm kind of skewed because I was talking to Becky about this the other day. The first time I ever walked into or, you know, ex logged on to a synchronous session, it was in Second Life. So I think I was completely ruined, but I wouldn't say ruined, um, but exposed right there and anything less than this just doesn't compare because you have your instructor right there in front of you even though I may be in Florida traveling somewhere or you know my instructor is at home, we're all in our pajamas, but we're here and we're able to interact with one another because I mean sometimes you can't even control your avatar so you walk into your instructor. Um, so there's really low transactional distance within the second um, life setting and so it makes for a great uh, environment to be able to have very little um, structure in the way that you know this kind of forces you to interact because when you come in here you have questions and you can't help but ask a question if you can't move or if you can't stop running or um, experience. Okay, we just lost you for a second, or I did, Shannon, so. Oh, can you hear me? Why don't you just make your last point uh, one more time, just in case. Oh, I was, just saying, I was just saying that um, for me, Second Life um, really makes a great low transactional distance. Excellent. So, one of the things that we really believe in in, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, is that we do have an instructor presence, the student presence um, as well. And so being able to lower that, lower that distance between the instructor and the student is critically important for the education transaction to happen and to for the, um, for the students to feel a comfort level so that they will be highly engaged and and fearless, uh, which is another one of my big goals, is to help them uh, be comfortable and relaxed and trusting so that they can make mistakes and learn uh, learn more. So, um, so we feel like that transactional resistance is one of the things we really need to attend to. Another one of the theories that we're most uh, interested in is the community of inquiry. Um, and this, of course, um, has to do with students learning, and um, it also has to do with, uh, or, or where, the way we address it is how we set up the course um, and how we um, design activities and other um, other things that we're asking the students to do, activities and readings and various other things. So. There is a lot of attention to design um, as we uh, build this community of inquiry. And so I'd love for you to hear, one of the reasons I have Shannon here is I'd love for you to hear our students' perspective of that. So you're on, Shannon. <laughs> okay, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay. Um, so community of inquiry. Um, well, again, I think Second Life um, does a great service to being able to create a community of inquiry because it's all about um, social presence, teaching presence, cognitive presence, um, 
So social presence as an online learner, you have to feel comfortable enough to be able to present yourself as a real person. Um, and we all get to create what we want to look like. Um, hence why I have wings today. Just felt like having some wings. <laughs> um, and you also have to be able, feel comfortable enough to ask questions um, within that social presence. Um, and that really comes from teaching presence. I have found, of course, um, Becky has incredible teaching presence because she embraces this environment so much. She's an expert in not only the subjects that we're learning, the virtual world and the theories and practice of transactional or, or distance learning, sorry, um, but she's able to help us with all of our technology problems um, and that ties into teaching, um, oh yes, you can pay me. <laughs> Um, teaching presence and um, and then cognitive presence you really have to be able to interact with the material you know you go out on your own study um, learn what you need to and then you come back in and share with others um, you know the the content that you're learning for the module um, and create knowledge together through all these three um, presences overlapping. So the class itself um, within Second Life that we've had each one has created their own communities around the topics that we are learning and I think the best classes I have ever had um, have been in Second Life because this is a unique experience and you're in this world and you're creating it with your fellow learners and your instructor um, and it is all based around the content of the class that you're learning. working together with their group on their own time, they can set the times that they do that. And then we try to give them an environment to work together. So we find that web conferencing is a great way to do that. Um, and we Yes, please. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I just I was just saying that you have to have a teacher that's willing to um you know create that environment and Second Life really does create a unique opportunity to have a, a community created about the content um that you're learning. Uh, okay, are you hearing me now? Okay. <laughs> all right. We'll just be patient while we, we all know how this goes. <laughs> um, so, we, so one of the main things that we do is we set up environments for students to be able to work together. And we were pretty, pretty happy with web conferencing. And I do believe that most people are more comfortable with that. And we found it interesting that students would be, when they work together, our online students, because um, the online students, my stu online students, often got together at like 10 o'clock on a Monday night, um, which was not when I would ever have a meeting with them if I was going to set it up. So allowing it to be the students' convenience 
at the student's convenience is one of the main things that we feel is very, very important. And, uh, and giving them places to be able to meet and then the, doing the support for that. So teaching them how to use web conferencing um, and allowing them uh, some comfort level before you give them a required um, time to meet together on their own. As we pull the virtual world into that, I'm sure all of you are, are uh, immediately, and, and we have a good example of it today with our technical problems, um, that learning curve goes way, way, way up. And so it takes a good amount of time to get them comfortable. And I also think the requirements need to be minimal. So we try to give them just a few things that they have to do here in SL um, and help them have it a lot of practice as they do that so that they do have some some real comfort level and feel a little more like experts. So we don't ask them to do huge things um, and we start start small as we move to bigger and bigger things that they might do. And it does depend on the course. So in the in the virtual worlds course we push them a little harder, we have them build more um, and eventually they it culminates with scaffold to where they they're able to build a project themselves, um, utilizing that community where, where they can support each other. Um, in the theory and practice course, we're just dabbling a little bit. And so we might make that, have them make a cube, a, a box, and maybe pull a PowerPoint slide onto it so that we can do a few activities where they're engaged, but nothing where it's so big that they don't feel like they can handle it and get frustrated. So. I believe that's, that's our elements for the community of inquiry piece, um, setting up those, those groups, helping them have reasons to work in groups. And it's very interesting to me, and Shannon can support this, that they actually complain like crazy about groups, but then they end up saying that's the most powerful piece of the course, where that they were working together and learning together. We we know that students don't think don't know what they need to need to know. <laughs> well, and I think second, I think second life makes the group much easier. Um, just from the experience, it it makes the group work much easier. Um, just from from my groups that I've had uh, working in second life, they've been the most successful ones that I've worked in. Well, so so that's really important for us to talk about, and so maybe we should just jump to that, um, and then we can come back to the challenges. So why do you think, Shannon, that the students chose Second Life over web conferencing? Well, I mean, if you look ar around us right now, just the beautiful interactive environment, number one, um, it's fun to get in here and really start playing once you get over that initial um, learning curve. I think it's a much more interactive environment. Um, my group that I was in, in my, um, and what was it, the theory and practice of distance learning class, started off meeting in web conferencing, and then we just would always switch over and meet here in Second Life, because it's like you're really there with the person. Um, and you can do so many amazing things in Second Life that you can't in a web conferencing session. Web conferencing is so stark um, and cold compared to this amazing interactive environment where you can go and visit other worlds that support some of the things that you're learning. Um, so, or some of the things that you want to create um, based on what your project is in, in our virtual worlds class. So for me and, and, you know, working with the students, it's just a fun interactive environment. We were filming our video and, and like my story, I always look like I'm drunk when I'm walking. And so, you know, we just build great rapport and great experiences and it's like you're there with the person. Um, next to you doing it. So um, it's just, you can't beat this environment. So other students really say the same exact thing, and, um, and I'm super fascinated by that. 
uh, because they even say things like, well, you know, in, in web conferencing, you can't see you can't see anybody's face. You don't know exactly what they're thinking because we don't use a lot of video in web conferencing. We use audio, and I'm dying laughing because we can't see each other's face in Second Life. But isn't it fascinating that the the fact that we have avatars and that our avatars are moving around a little bit, they do come away with that perception that we see the other pre people's face. Now, you and I are all here, and we're here because we love virtual worlds, I'm sure, and that, and we do a lot of socializing and doing professional interaction here as well. And I bet if somebody asked us about that, we'd probably say the same thing. But we, we feel like we're with the person, uh, and we we might not say we can see their faces, but I think we have this sort of perception. I'm super fascinated by that uh, because our avatars are taking the place of us in this transactional distance piece. Now we're sitting together at a, at a uh, university virtual world. Uh, we aren't all sitting in front of our computers across, across the world. Uh, we're here together today in our, in our minds. Interesting, interesting. Um, so, Sharon, let's let's go back just a little bit. What do you think the challenges were? Because I, we certainly do feel like there were some challenges for students, and we've talked a little bit about it. But uh, could you go in a little more depth with that, and, and please re reflect some of your your colleagues' experiences? Sure. As well. Yes. Yes. So, I think number one across the board is the learning curve when you come into Second Life. For our class, um, the first class, we had to choose our avatar, kind of um, customize our avatar, really make it our own, um, learning how to build, learning how to walk, how to fly, how to get out of, uh, someone put an outhouse here on, on UNM's land and I got stuck in it and I would go out of the world, come back in, and I still couldn't get back out for a couple times. Um, so just that initial learning curve falling into the water in our duck pond here behind us. Um, I know every every person that um, that I've talked to and that, and that Becky and I have interacted with about this subject is learning curve number one. Um, number two is not everybody has access to the bandwidth to support Second Life. Um, here in Albuquerque, where UNM is, we have very good bandwidth, we have great Wi-Fi, but if you go outside of our city limits, there is a lack of infrastructure. Um, so depending on where the students lived, um, depending on how old your computer was, because when I was um, in the virtual worlds class, my computer was really close to crashing, so that was a struggle for me every time, just making sure I could get up, get online, um, stay there, that everybody could hear me. Um, so, so that's a challenge. Um, I think you have a challenge for people who are just um, resistant to the environment because they don't see its value. Um, I know even within my program there are people who don't like online learning and that's the whole program pretty much. You know, there are face-to-face -face classes that are offered but, but the bulk of it is online. So then you have to deal with the people who aren't comfortable using the technology um, and, you know, helping them or they may be a group member that's not so on board. So so just kind of dealing with those issues. Um, but those were the three main ones, I would say. So I, I completely agree. Yeah, access, uh, access, access for sure with everything. But one of the things that we did uh, find was that we were using a pretty powerful program and we have a, a really nice technical crew who have it installed well and one of the reasons we chose it was because it did some nice caching uh, for students back in the day who were on dial-up um, and so it was it's called it's the blackboard uh, web conferencing system now called collaborate um, but what I found fascinating was the students actually said they had better sound and better uh, and and crashed less. Only I don't know that they actually crashed 
um, in web conferencing, but perhaps it, you know they just were um, were not able to hear and not able to um, access things. Maybe they did uh, crash out of the session, but I don't remember that very often. Um, and so they um, they but they kept saying that Second Life was was better as far as their being able to access and being able to hear and move around. Um, so I actually use their Second Life client, um, and I just leave them there. Um, we talk about the other ones. I have a couple of more ones that are my favorite, um, but I feel like that they that it's less learning curve. So thank you for that great question, Cami. Um, Shannon, what do you use? Because you've been in two classes, so do you still use the Second Life client? Do you well, what is the Second Life client? Basically, the <laughs> so viewer. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, no, yes, I do use the Second Life viewer because that's right. Because I was having such a technology problem. I'm sorry. It just it just jarred my memory. And you told me to to uh, what was it? Use a different one, and I can't remember Firestorm. which one it was. Um, but no, now with my new computer, it's I use the Second Life viewer. Yeah. yeah. So if I went very um, oh yes, you're exactly right, and I've used Singularity, and and I I really is. like it too. Uh, maybe it was Singularity that we moved you to, Shannon. I, I think it I've was. I've forgotten now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so that is certainly one of the things we do when they have trouble, and it's an excellent point, Kimmy. Um, it can it can be very heavy, but we're back to that trying to keep it simple for them. And so when so we started, and I'll just address that a little bit as well. When we started. I just sent them in. They made their own. Um, they uh, made their own um, account and um, the, downloaded the viewer. I, one of my biggest challenges was helping them understand the difference between the the um, the viewer itself and the the um, site, uh, the Second Life website, because often they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get into Second Life after they were on the website. Um, so the application and the and the browser, of the, the website, it was hard for them to differentiate from. Um, so that's when I started having face-to-face -face, um, sessions with them to help them get in. The, this last semester, I went ahead and made avatars for everyone and, um, and did a few of those things that you do at the beginning to just get the avatars looking good. Now they look better when you get one right away, but back in the day they were pretty icky. Um, so I do a few of those things and have them become a part of the group, um, bef and then I give them access to my avatars. Um, and so they're my class avatars, and that includes the viewer. So that's how simple I try to make it for them, because I do think the challenges are pretty hard. Um, at the beginning, they talk about it all the time. Maybe I should just send them into Singularity right away. Um, I, that's a really excellent idea. Um, and then I could use it. Do you? So that's a great, that I, I have learned something. That's a really good idea. Because I feel like I have to use the Second Life Viewer myself. Because I'm, if I'm going to help them, I have to have that pretty easily uh, right then in the moment to be able to go find the right menu and whatever. So I will try that this summer. Thank you so much. That's very true. They do get upset. So one of the other challenges I feel um, are the fact that they're skeptics. And I can really relate to that because I might even still be a skeptic. <laughs> I, it's hard for me to talk to my colleagues about it um, because they just think I'm so weird whenever I I talk about Second Life, they just have heard enough about it that they are, they just think it's weird. Um, so, but I eventually, I, I have quite a few of them that have uh, kind of let that go. But students are skeptical as well, and you know, I have grad students, and, and most of them are older and professionals, and so bringing them into something that looks a little like a, a game is, is a little hard for them, and they can be whiny. Um, so to me, that is a little bit of my of my challenge, is how do I ease them in? How do I help them embrace this and feel comfortable enough at the beginning um, to be able to, to at least move forward a little bit? So how can we set their skeptics? 
skeptic, the skeptic piece of him uh, aside. Um, so you're evangelist, huh, Maggie? Yeah, I, I, my husband is too, and he hasn't been in World of All either, but um, <laughs> I love that thought about therapy. I'm going to start calling it that. <laughs> Even trying to get funded for this is a little hard getting it through purchasing. Um, so, because they're like, what the heck? Um, so that is certainly a challenge. It is certainly a challenge. So, um, so we'd like to move to um, the, so we've talked about student choice and why they're, why all of them, and I mean it sincerely, even with all those, our skeptics, all of them were landing here. All of them wanted to be here instead of web conferencing. Um, so what is it about the environment, the learning, and the community of practice? How is this all coming together? But we have a question first. So um, do we find male students less willing? Shannon, what do you think? I, I have <laughs> Actually, no, I don't think so. <laughs> because the guys, we had one guy. Um, who came to class, I couldn't figure out who he was because he completely changed his avatar and there was this woman avatar here when we were, you know, meeting for class and I was like, who in the heck is this? And and then I read his name and he had completely changed his avatar and morphed his voice into a female voice. Um, the the men that I have been in class with, um, one of them turned themselves into a werewolf. Um, another one very much represented himself, um, who he, he and I are both going to graduate in a few weeks, and he really embraced this environment. Um, I don't think that the gentlemen are the skeptics, um, what I've run into, but that's just my personal um, outlook. I mean, um, Actually, two of them are using Second Life for their class purposes, and I'm sure Becky will talk about this, but one of them is using it for the UNM e EMT program. Um, he created a whole kind of little mini campus, and then the other one is using it for math tutoring. Um, so I, I don't think they are. Oh, I love Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> that is so fun. See, I do also believe that it has to do with who, how creative you want to be with yourself, maybe. I mean, that's the start, because the only thing you have to work with is your avatar. And certainly you want to give them a chance to, to change that. And I, I, I agree, um, Kimmy, that the women probably embrace that piece first. Um, and, and my former, my very first classes did talk about, or, or did my experience was that the, the men were a little more reluctant. Um, and so perhaps it is that. Maybe it's just as simple as the avatar, because now they do have a, have a few choices that they can just easily become, um, you know, uh, zombies or whatever they are. Um, and so they're able to be correct more creative and I, I love Maggie that you're talking about your husband because it's actually because of my husband that I even continue to be in here and that's a long story and someday we can share it but my husband was I was writing my dissertation and he was uh, trying to keep busy and, and we had been dragging him in here and the next thing I knew he was hanging out with the musicians and he was in Australia where he'd always wanted to go um, and those kinds of things. So I believe it's the, if you get an opportunity, if, you, if there's something that you can become um, and because there's more books for women, maybe that was why we had more women interest at first. But that's there's no research based on that <laughs> at all. That is just totally my experience, my own experience. Interesting, and I love dancing in here. It's one of the reasons I continue to come because I am a terrible dancer in real life, but I am so stunning in here, as I'm sure you guys are too. Um, so it is very interesting to see. I truly believe that it is the environment as well as the learning that can happen in here and the community of practice. The, the fact that virtual worlds, we're, we're able to build a better community in here. Um, 
than we are. So this this very environment, I mean, falling in the water is the thing I do the, the best as well. I was a, I'm getting a little better, and I've been here for almost seven years. Um, but, but when you do, then you're laughing together with each other, and um, I think all of that adds together to bring us um, this wonderful, wonderful learning environment and, um, and builds that community practice. So the picture on the slide is an example of my last student's work, um, and it was a man and a woman um, that were working in community colleges. They didn't know each other before, um, but they had a need. One of them was an emergency medicines person, and he was studying the heart. And so it's a little hard to see from the slide, but that we did a skybox and gave them a place to build, and they built the human heart and a chance to walk around in it, around in it, and use note cards and signs to be able to do some learning. By the time they finished, they were so excited about about what they could do um, in this kind of environment. And as you guys know, I mean, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to build in here once once you get the hang of it. It's it's not that challenging, and I believe that that is one of the, the strengths of the environment as well. Um, so um, we also have another EMS person, so maybe that's, that's who lives in Albuquerque and takes our courses, um, but he has a, he was, the, he was the person who became the woman avatar for a while, he's very brave, um, and he does teach for our um, hospital, and um, so we have given the second floor, or the third floor, I'm sorry, of the building behind us to him, and we are very happy for you guys to walk through it if you'd like. Um, so he has built a classroom in there, and he has um, several simulations uh, that help with teaching his EMS students. Um, I'm going to let uh, Shannon talk about the last two projects that she did with her group and another group that in the class she was in. So my group built a kind of mini museum on Annie Oakley and her life and chronicling it. Um, and we made it uh, interactive with touch boxes that uh, would, you know, give information uh, on, on the periods of her life um, and we built a whole wild west town pretty much up in the sky box so um, the heart was in the sky box this past summer and we were in the sky box the summer before that um, and it was just really fun to be able to go in and and do that you know my original vision for that when I was talking to Becky about that this week was to build an actual museum like the um, uh, what the the Wild West Museum that's in St. Louis, and I know that's not the the right term for it, but my mind went blank. Um, but but through group collaboration, we kind of came up with a different format, and it really turned out great. Um, you know, we had fence posts for people to sit on. We had a movie to play about Annie Oakley's life, and and we had found in Second Life a Wild West town that we actually went in and recorded our our um, Second Life video. I believe they call it what is it, Machinima. Um, and that's where I was walking drunk down the street and into the old buildings. And that that experience there um, is one that I kind of want to go back to and how Second Life can create such a strong bond and learning experience and environment because, you know, I had never met my group members before we started our whole Annie Oakley project. And about a year later, I finally met one of them face to face and we picked up just like we were sitting at our computer desks um, laughing, making that video. Um, it really forms great bonds and it's very effective learning because you are having to build your content and figure out how you're going to go through and, and you know, make the learning as, as meaningful and impactful as possible. And while you're doing that, you're building um, really great social connections and social learning because everybody picks up on different pieces and contributes their own um, their own part to the project. Um, and then the other project that we had was um, done by uh, one of my 
she and I took the virtual world um, class in the summer, and then we ended up taking uh, the theory and practice of distance learning in the fall, um, and she and I were in a group together in the fall, um, which helped a lot. But she and her group, um, she is a K through 12 teacher. She teaches um, high school Spanish, um, and they ended up building a whole Dia de los Puertos um, uh, presentation, which um, for people who don't know, it's the Day of the Dead and celebrating your loved ones that have passed away. Um, and I had never liked this holiday ever, and I'm from New Mexico. <laughs> I've never liked this holiday until I walked through their um, their their build and really understood what it was. And now I'm like, I love all the skulls. I love the fancy paint. I want to do that for Halloween, but it would scare my son if that's what I went as. But it's really amazing the learning experiences that you can create for others. Um, and it was phenomenal what they did, their build. It was it was wonderful. I, I had that exact same experience, and we, we hadn't talked. That's very interesting. Um, we will have to check that out. That's fantastic, Maggie. Um, and we'll have to tell, tell Kayla about it because what a powerful thing to be able to experience something like that um, and hear that person's take on it and then it, it completely changes your attitude. Um, so we really got, and we really found value in that. I did think of one other thing. Um, Kayla, who built the Dia de los Muertos, was very skeptical going in. Um, to Second Life at first because she wasn't sure, you know, she was ex exploring it as a teacher to see would it be a tool that she would use and she was really skeptical of it and she very much embraces it now, very much. And just like everything else in life, I mean, you have to experience things, I guess, but trying to help people experience them is uh, a little harder sometimes in here and we want to we want to encourage folks to not let that um, not let that slow us down. So I, I, I did mention, I mean, this is that scaffolding. Um, so I have, the, I have the students come in, they're skeptics, they're worried, they fall in water, they walk drunk, <laughs> uh, just like all of us do. Um, and we just keep pressing on and, and you just, I, I feel like that that's where the community of inquiry and, the trend, and bridging those, that transactional distance really plays in. So the theory uh, of the things that we know really assists us in being able to address real issues and helping students embrace things that they might normally not be able to um, embrace. And then we are able to manage that learning because, um, because then once they embrace an environment that supports things that we have trouble doing other places, then we've made huge gains. Um, and so we, so that is my approach, and I certainly try to help give them lots of support and, and make things as simple as possible for them at the beginning, but continue to push them just a little farther than they want to go, they think they want to go. Um, and the next thing you know, because if I told them at the first week that we were going to do, be doing machinima, I, they probably would all drop the class. Um, and so, because they would not ever think in a million years that they could do a video. And yet, um, it's very fun, and I should have probably taped that some, some time and play it for people, but when they're working on their projects and I'm coming in to just make sure everything's okay, the giggling and the joy and the, the engagement is just so rewarding. And it's rewarding for them and it's rewarding for uh, for me as well. So, um, so the challenges and possibilities um, as we wind this up. Um, the challenges we've talked about quite a bit. Um, the possibilities are certainly endless and I feel like I am, even though I've been around uh, Second Life for a long time I've, and I've taught in it for several years, I just have very very hard, very much just touched the tip of the iceberg of the opportunities and so that's one of the reasons I bring in experts so I have several colleagues that are so helpful that um, who so we bring our experiences together um, 
and I, we're not just limited to me and what I can experience as I have a very demanding job and I also want to continue teaching. So that's another piece of that community, isn't it? So we bring our professional community together to help each other. We build community for our students to help support them. Um, and it does address a lot of our challenges and, um, and opens up tremendous amounts of, a, of possibilities. Anything you'd like to add for that, Shannon? Yes. Um, so we did have a question is, did we explore other sims? And yes, part of Becky's virtual world class is she takes us into other um, environments other than just Second Life. And I, we had a really bad experience in one of them where it just kept crashing, 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 crashing um, the night that we had visited it. and. Um, so I think that's why I'm just kind of an ardent believer in Second Life. <laughs> um, oh, in Second Life, yeah, we, yes, so uh, also one of the things that Becky has us do is um, at the very beginning is we go on basically a scavenger hunt and look for different um, Second Life um, sites and then we also so she has ones that she wants us to visit and then we also have to bring back um, sites or Second Life destinations I should say that um, we would like to share with our class and you know St. Louis Arch is just amazing that's one that I found that I loved um, and so yes we do go go outside and, and like I said we found that um, uh, you know what, it, what was it, Wild West Town to shoot our video in, and we used that. Um, we asked the, the creators of that if we could do that. Um, so yes, we do explore lots of different parts of Second Life, and, and Becky tells us, you know, just if it's questionable, don't go in there, so, <laughs> which is a general rule. <laughs> so um, the challenges, because I know we're getting close, I, I want to focus on this because I think a big challenge that I see is convincing the instructors who may even be weary of teaching online, even though they have to, of the possibilities of Second Life. Um, I think selling people on Second Life and making them see that this is not some seedy world, but that it opens great doors and has great potential. And I was thinking about this this morning, you know, how could we use it in a K through 12 environment? We'll just have the kids automatically signed on already on the environment that we want them to be in. If we're teaching them a history lesson, like I, I got my bachelor's in American history, so I love that. There's so many possibilities that you can um, do in Second Life. And if you have them set up where they don't know the password, they come into your classroom setting of, let's say, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, or the Wild West Frontier, um, and you have them learn about it that way, how much more exciting is that? And especially for our students today, you know, why take away technology from them when they are so um, wired to it and make their classrooms even more boring than they are. Um, so I, those are possibilities for K through 12. I mean, for, for um, the corporate world, there's so many possibilities here. My cousin works um, in the mining industry and he sees the possibilities. He's been talking to me about it. So, um, but the challenge is making the non-believers believe um, for me. And, and I'm a firm supporter and believer in uh, the virtual world. And it's how do we get those people who don't have an open mind about it to consider it and see the amazing um, things that can be done in here. So wow, how did a whole hour go by? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are a wonderful audience. Thank you. This is very easy. Um, so yes, um, Fidget, we agree, and we used to have, you know, SL for kids or whatever it used to be, and it was a little more protected. Um, most of us that are are using, are promoting using uh, virtual worlds for kids are talking about using other worlds um, or making, uh, keeping them in a, in a place, uh, yes, a, a grid or a, or a sim that we're, um, where we have a little more control in trying to keep them there. So there, we want we don't want to ignore that. We certainly do yeah, not want to Yeah, no, and that was just my thought is how do you keep them safe so they're not doing it on their own, so you're there supervising it. I was just thinking about that this morning of how in the heck do you do that because this has such great potential. 
So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Virtual um, world, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really can't. That's for sure. And, and even with my adult uh, students, I do have to talk about, I, I just say Second Life is the real internet and they have to be careful. Um, and they have choices and they're grown ups, and they can, you know, do what they want. But it isn't like we're clueless that what goes on around here. Um, and they can certainly find lots of things if they want to look for it. Um, and luckily, in my, I have adult students, and they're allowed to do that. But I do feel like I'm opening up some things to them. Um, so to keep, make sure we don't get too far uh, past our time, we just want you to know that we believe that virtual worlds do strongly address transactional distance, and they are very conducive to using communities of inquiry. And we uh, are delighted to be here and. Um, and I see some questions running, and we don't want to ignore those. Here is my contact information, and we so appreciate having you here. So let me cruise through these questions, or Shannon may have already, and we can certainly. I, um, I know they're them. disappearing on me because they're coming in so fast. Yeah, um, well, in my, I have my window open, but I had to have it small, so let me go back just a tiny bit. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, Linden Labs. We have we have our worries about Linden Labs, but I do think um, I think the educational community is growing is a growing back in here, so that's great. And I do I have colleagues who believe that they have set up pretty safe environments in here and in other uh, in other grids for sure. So um, oh, are there avatar safety classes in here? That's a great question. Does anybody know the answer to that? Can you point us to where we would find that picture? Thank you. Great. Great. That is wonderful. That is fantastic because we certainly want to want to keep that as part of our curriculum. Oh, we, Caledon, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're great people. So it is, tw it is uh, 11.59. What a privilege to get to be here, everyone. Thank you so much for coming.